is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. In this, the fifth episode of the podcast, I return to Inner City Books in Toronto, Canada, where I had the privilege to sit down once again with the living legend that is Daryl Sharp. Daryl founded Inner City Books in 1980 to promote the understanding and practical application of the work of C.G. Jung. It's still the only publishing house in the world devoted exclusively to books written by Jungian analysts. There are now over 140 titles by over 50 authors in the series Studies in Jungian Psychology by Jungian Analysts, authoritative works on basic Jungian principles, women's studies, spirituality, alchemy, relationships, dream and fairy tale interpretation, masculine psychology, midlife issues, and much more. Over a million and a half books have been sold, with more than 250 editions in 20 languages. Their acclaimed authors include Marie-Louise von Franz, Edward Edinger, Marion Woodman, and James Hollis. Daryl Sharp is a writer, publisher, Jungian analyst, and all-around self-proclaimed bon vivant. We decided to talk about his book, Personality Types, Jung's Model of Typology, a subject we both feel very passionately about. We had quite a number of technical difficulties that day, so our talk runs for only about 30 minutes. Daryl has a lot more to say about typology, so please do pick up a copy of his book, which Inner City has generously offered as a free ebook. You can visit the website speakingofjung.com for links to the books and on how to find this podcast on iTunes and on Stitcher so that you can listen to it on your phone, your tablet, and even in your car. Please subscribe to the show, and I would be very grateful if you would also take a few moments to write a review. I'm back in Toronto at Inner City Books in Daryl Sharp's consultation room. Hi, Daryl. Well, it's great to see you again, Laura. I've come here today to talk about your book, Personality Types, Jung's Model of Typology, because I decided to tweet that book cover to cover sometime during this past year because of how important I think it is and how much it's helped me. It's helped me to understand myself and just as importantly, helped me to understand the people around me and just people in general, uh, our differences, what we have in common and and how we differ and kind of why. So what led you to write the book? Uh, an interest in the same things you just outlined. Yeah. And my interest was piqued by Jung's motivation in writing his long book, Volume 6 of the Collective Works, Psychological Types, in which he spends about 400 pages tracing different views of uh, temperaments from the philosophical, the physical, uh, the classical, astrological, and so on. And then in his last section of the of that book, he does uh, a summary of the types and right. how they interact with each other. Because as you say, the experience that not everyone functions in the same way is the basis for the system of typology. Yes, and we know that by experience. What Jung did was codify it in a particular way, uh, which I would summarize this way. Imagine a circle... And you have the cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. Uh, Jung postulated, discovered two attitude types, introversion and extroversion. And he coined those words now commonly used. So he was the first to use... He was the first to use those uh, that classification. And beyond that, he then isolated four different ways of functioning which could be either introverted or extroverted. Mm -hmm. And those four functions, the, the attitude types, introversion and extroversion, and the function types are thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. Mm -hmm. And if you visualize a circle, and at the top cardinal point you put thinking, then opposite to that, the south pole of the circle, mm -hmm. Uh, would be feeling. And then the two, uh, east and west, would be what he called auxiliary functions, sensation and intuition, mm -hmm. being opposites. He said that although introversion and extroversion have become household words, 
Their meaning is frequently misunderstood. How do you think introversion and extroversion are misunderstood? How are they misunderstood? Yeah. Well, introversion may be confused with introspection, but introverts don't have a monopoly on introspection. Introspection depends on time alone and delving into yourself. Uh, We needn't talk about projection, I think, because we know quite a lot about projecting our own wishes and contents of our own unconscious onto someone else. Uh, And then we often find that these are expectations that grew out of our own predilections, typologically or, or from our own complexes. So other than projection, the other major psychological factor that regularly plagues relationships is uh, misunderstandings because of typology. Right. Uh, I've written about that in, at length in uh, Digesting Young, uh, my book. And what I didn't say a lot about there is the problem of conflict and typology. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the role that typology plays in conflict be, uh, within relationships. And we recall that the reflective nature of the introvert causes him usually to think and consider before acting. Mm. This naturally makes him slow to act. His shyness and distrust of things induce hesitation, and so he may have difficulty in adapting to the external world. Conversely, the extrovert has a positive relation to things, that is, outside objects, people, so he is attracted to them. His actions are swift and subject to few misgivings or hesitations. Naturally, the two types seem designed for an ideal union. The introvert takes care of reflection while the extrovert sees to the initiative and practical action. This can work for a long time, as long as the couple is occupied with what Jung calls the manifold external needs of life, that is, raising a family, job, and home. But later, perhaps not until all the kids are out and away on their own, the two types turn face to face and discover they do not understand one another. Mm -hmm. This can be a very disconcerting experience. Jung puts it like this. Each speaks a different language. Then the conflict between the two types begins. This struggle is envenomed, brutal, full of mutual depreciation, even when conducted quietly and in the greatest intimacy. For the value of one is the negation of value for the other. So, still, uh, so paradise lost. Still, many couples survive such crises and live together to a ripe old age with a satisfying degree of mutual acceptance. Learning to accept the other's complexes and typology is eros in action. Mm. But how is this possible given their differences? Well, Jung suggests that it is due to the unconscious compensation of the types. Uh, No one is simply introverted or simply extroverted, but has both attitudes potentially uh, in him or her, although they may have developed only one of them as a function of adaptation. So with the introvert, extroversion lies dormant and undeveloped somewhere in the background, that is, in the unconscious. And that introversion leads to similar shadowy existence in the extrovert. And that is indeed the case. The introvert does possess an extroverted attitude, but it is unconscious. Because his conscious gaze is always turned to the subject. He sees the object, of course, but has false or inhibiting ideas about it, so that he keeps his distance as much as possible. And I want to also add that This unconscious compensation may manifest typically in later life when a person's opposite attitude may need to come to the fore to give new life to the individual so that someone who has been sedentary and uh, introverted 
for years may suddenly become dry and stale uh, to him or herself and needs to get out more. But conversely, the extrovert who is maybe the life of the party for much of his or her life may need to be home and read a book. Right. And get to know themselves in a way they never have. So the two different attitudes, introversion and extroversion, what is the difference between the two? An extrovert is oriented towards the outside world. The introvert is oriented towards the inner world. And then the four and Then the four function functions. types. Briefly, sensation function tells you that something exists. The thinking function tells you what it is. The feeling function tells you what it's worth to you, whether that's a person or an object. And the into the intuitive function tells you the possibilities, what can be done with it. Jung speaks of that as information from the unconscious, mm -hmm. a perception of things we are normally unaware of. And you say that whether one is introverted or extroverted only becomes apparent in association with one of the four functions each of which, as you explained, has its own special area of expertise. So yes. whether or not a person is introverted or extroverted is in association with one of those four. Yes. And Jung compared uh, his model to a compass, mm -hmm. noting that he would not for anything dispense with this compass on his psychological voyages of discovery. And personally, it's the best model I know for understanding myself and others. And you say that in practice, all four functions, we all have it all, but all four are not equally at one's conscious disposal. They're not uniformly developed or differentiated. That one tends to be more developed, and you call that the superior function. Right, and that function tends to be superior because it brings success of one kind or another in relationships or in work life. And the one that is harder to get at is called the inferior function. And those aren't judgments, one being better than the other, they're right. just different. Mm -hmm. And in a, the inferior function is generally inaccessible to the ego, whereas the superior function comes easily. So you say that typologically, many people are a bowl of soup. Yes. Uh, so most people are unconscious and they have not differentiated the way they function. That's why I call it a bowl of soup. Uh, the opposite of that is once you've differentiated the functions and have a better idea of how you react in the world to situations and other people, you would be called well-balanced, mm -hmm. especially if you can call up at will a function that you're not usually good at. And we generally have one or two auxiliary functions besides the superior function, so that thinking often is paired with sensation and you get practical scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, or if it's paired with intuition, it could be a theoretical physicist. Just to stay in summarizing the structure of his model, two of the four functions he termed as rational, and the other two as irrational, and that thinking and feeling are the two rational functions, and sensation and intuition are the two irrational functions. Yes. You said thinking and feeling are called rational because both are based on a reflective, linear process that coalesces into a particular judgment. And that sensation and intuition, each is a way of perceiving simply what is. Yes. So you've explained what introversion and extroversion are. You've explained a little bit about thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. So that's Jung's model. Those six concepts, each of the four functions paired with one of the two attitudes, so in Jung's model, there are eight basic types. Eight possibilities of functioning, yes. 
I'm sure you've heard of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Yes. And what I've noticed is that people erroneously feel one of two things, either Myers-Briggs developed this model themselves or that it is Jung's model of typology, and neither one of those are true. What can you tell us about the Myers-Briggs type indicator? Well, it's, it's claimed to be based on Jung's model, and broadly speaking, it is. I'm not in favor of type testing for several reasons. One is that it's not dynamic. Mm-hmm. It is specific to a time and place and implies that the individual doesn't change. Uh, And I think we know from experience that that's not true, that one can change throughout life to a different orientation. Personally, I was much more extroverted as a young man than Mm -hmm. I am now, and my orientation was thinking sensation. It's now more intuition and feeling. Mm which is the other side of the spectrum. The other reason I'm not in favor of type tests is that once a person takes the test, they are inclined to identify with that label. Right. Now, I'm sure there are some practitioners of these tests, interpreters, because that's a gift and an art in itself, to interpret the results when you take a Myers-Briggs type indicator test. And I'm sure some of them emphasize that this is just for today. You might test differently tomorrow. Right. So if anyone is interested in following their own type through testing, I'd advise them to do it in, over time. Uh, but it is more valuable if you base your knowledge and understanding of your typology on your experience in the world. Mm -hmm. What did I miss in that encounter? What could I have said or done? How how could I have functioned in a different way to make the outcome more agreeable? Yeah, you said that tests say nothing about the way in which one's usual way of functioning may be determined by complexes and they do not reflect the ever-present compensating attitude of the unconscious. You say typically it is the persona that is taking the test. Yes. Yes. Well, the ego via their persona. And that you explain one of the functions may be buried so deeply in someone's shadow that only a major life crisis (laughs) precipitating a nervous breakdown would uncover it. Yes, that's what happened to me, Uh, what took me into analysis. Mm -hmm. The way I was functioning in life just wasn't working anymore. And uh, I didn't know it. Uh, I wasn't really conscious of that until I woke up one morning sobbing uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. And then I went into analysis. You give an example here that You say that he may have labored for years to fulfill the expectations of other people. He may have repressed his longing for extroverted activity to the point where he himself hardly knows it exists. Extroversion, and say maybe the feeling function, may be buried so deeply in a shadow that only a major crisis precipitating a nervous breakdown would uncover it. This is in the section about type tests and how they don't take into account the experiential activity that a person's typological preferences can change over time. You said the bottom line is that an externally evaluated test, even though self-administered, is not a reliable guide to what is going on inside, and that there is no substitute for prolonged self-reflection. Yes, that's my opinion. I wanted to say something about the consequences of the different ways of functioning Remembering the model, the thinking function is opposite to the feeling function. Consequently, don't ask a thinking type, man or woman, how they feel. They just don't know. Though excellent at matters of fact, their feelings are shadow territory. They must think long and hard to know what they feel. Now, men are notorious for this. Uh, but I know some women who are also thinking types who 
have great difficulty in knowing how they feel. Mm -hmm. So being in love, for instance, knocks thinking types for a loop. It is a mystery and a dilemma. Similarly, for someone with a superior intuitive function, don't expect him or her to know where or when they are. That is, their inferior sensation. I have a friend who often gets lost when she comes to, her daughters get lost when she comes to Toronto. Uh, the daughter gets lost and she will is prone to call her mom at midnight saying, Mom, I'm going to please pick me up. And her mother says, where are you? And she said, well, I don't know. <laughs> and what time is it now? Don't know. That's and, sensation. And that, okay, so that's a great example of? Of an inferior sensation function. So you don't expect someone with a superior intuitive function, you don't expect them to know where or when they are. It's like speaking Urdu to a leprechaun. Likewise, it can be risky to press feeling types on what they are thinking. You could be skewered by their shadow. At the same time, paradoxically, the thinking type can actually care more deeply than her feeling type mate. Only she may not call it love, but loyalty, attachment, etc., or just plain foolishness. And the intuitive can sometimes see facts more clearly than his sensation-oriented friend. That is because the unconscious opposite function always has a say in what we are and do, proving that the psyche is not a single-minded affair. Mm. The psyche is not a single-minded affair. Yeah, I like no. that. But that's not even to bring in the complexes, which muddle everything. So it's not as cut and dried as people tend to think it is. Right. Because people tend to think only about their ego and are not familiar or aware of the possibilities that exist in the unconscious. And what is in the unconscious will show itself. Um, over time or from time to time, yes. So the inferior function is of the same nature as the primary function. So if I'm a sensation type, my inferior function would be intuition. If someone is a thinking person, their inferior function would be feeling. So it's always that way. That is the model, yes. In the book you write, to the extent that a person functions too one-sidedly, the inferior function becomes correspondingly primitive and troublesome both to oneself and to others. And there you quote Von Franz as saying, Life has no mercy with the inferiority of the inferior function. That the psychic energy claimed by the primary function takes energy away from the inferior function, which then falls into the unconscious. Yes, and she goes on to ask or to answer a question, how do you work on your inferior function? Mm -hmm. If your inferior function is sensation, for instance, it does no good to take up sewing or knitting or sculpting for a short time. You have to live it in some solid way that changes your whole orientation toward the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can see what problems this might cause in relationships when a person suddenly switches to a different way of functioning. Right. When a couple has been comfortably getting along in their usual unconscious fashion. So you need to be self-reflective to know which of the functions you're using in any given situation. And that takes a good deal of reflection and often personal anal analysis. Mm -hmm. If someone is not in analysis and they'd like to work on this, what's yes, it? Yes, and it can come to their attention by the reactions of other people mm -hmm. to them. Now, I think typology is so important 
that it ought to be taught in high school. I agree. Or early university, or at least when couples are planning to cohabit. And the same goes with complexes. The young people don't have the motivation that a middle-aged person generally right. uh, does after some experience of life. Um, a young person can dismiss typology as nonsense because they haven't lived long enough to have had difficulties in the way they function. Well, I, I sure do wish that it had been taught in schools because from an early age, I was very deeply introverted. And it seemed like not a lot of people around me were introverted. And I thought, what's wrong with me? Why am I not like these well, other people? It used to be a psychiatric diagnosis. I'm sure. Uh, of hysteria. The introvert is hysterical because she or he has no contact or very little with the outside world. Mm -hmm. It's now dropped from the DSM as a pathology. You know, my parents used to ask me, why do you always lock yourself in your room? <laughs> and what did you say? I didn't know what to say. But you felt more comfortable there. Yeah. And I used to say to my daughter, why are you always going out? Why don't you spend an evening reading a book? <laughs> she said, well, I want to see my friends and have fun. That's, it is what it is. Yeah. That's where we had to stop today. As I mentioned at the beginning, Daryl has a lot more to say about typology, so please pick up a copy of his book, Personality Types, Jung's Model of Typology. In the last chapter titled Concluding Remarks, there's a remarkable section on typology and the shadow. And since our interview was a little short, I thought I'd read that section here. Jung's model of typology is based on preferential or habitual ways of functioning. Used responsibly, it's a valuable guide to our dominant psychological disposition, the way we mostly are. It also reveals, by inference, the way we mostly aren't but could also be. Where then is the rest of us, mostly? Theoretically, we can say that the inferior or undeveloped attitude and functions are part of that side of ourselves Jung called the shadow. The reason for this is both conceptual and pragmatic. Conceptually, the shadow, like the ego, is a complex. But where the ego as the dominant complex of consciousness is associated with aspects of oneself that are more or less known as I, the shadow is comprised of personality characteristics that are not part of one's usual way of being in the world, and therefore more or less alien to one's sense of personal identity. The shadow is potentially both creative and destructive creative in that it represents aspects of oneself that have been buried or that might yet be realized, destructive in the sense that its value system and motivations tend to undermine or disturb one's conscious image of oneself. Everything that is not ego is relatively unconscious. Before the contents of the unconscious have been differentiated, the shadow is the unconscious. Since the opposite attitude and the inferior functions are by definition relatively unconscious, they're naturally tied up with the shadow. In one's immediate world, there are attitudes and behavior that are socially acceptable and those that are not. In our formative years, it's natural to repress or suppress the unacceptable aspects of ourselves. They fall into the shadow. What's left is the persona the I one presents to the outside world. The persona would live up to what is expected, what is proper. It's both a useful bridge socially and an indispensable protective covering. Without a persona, we're simply too vulnerable to others. We regularly cover up our inferiorities with a persona, since we don't like our weaknesses to be seen. The introverted thinking type at a noisy party may grit his teeth but smile. The extroverted feeling type may pretend to be studying when she's really climbing the wall for lack of company. Civilized society, life as we know it, depends on interactions between people through the persona. But it's psychologically unhealthy to identify with it, to believe that we're nothing but the person we show to others. 
generally speaking, the shadow is less civilized, more primitive, cares little for social propriety. What is of value to the persona is anathema to the shadow, and vice versa. Hence the shadow and the persona function in a compensatory way. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. The more one identifies with the persona, which in effect is to deny that one has a shadow, the more trouble one will have with the unacknowledged other side of the personality. Thus the shadow constantly challenges the morality of the persona, and to the extent that ego consciousness identifies with the persona, the shadow also threatens the ego. In the process of psychological development that Jung called individuation, disidentification from the persona and the conscious assimilation of the shadow go hand in hand. The ideal is to have an ego strong enough to acknowledge both persona and shadow without identifying with either of them. This is not as easy as it sounds. We tend to identify with what we're good at, and why shouldn't we? The superior function, after all, has an undeniable utilitarian value. It greases the wheels. Life runs smoothly. It generally brings praise, material rewards, a degree of satisfaction, it inevitably becomes a prominent aspect of the persona. Why give it up? The answer is that we don't, unless we have to. And when do we have to? When we encounter situations in life that are not amenable to the way we usually function. That is, when the way we tend to look at things doesn't work. In practice, as noted earlier, the shadow and everything associated with it is virtually synonymous with unlived life. There is more to life than this, is a remark heard often in the analyst's office. All that I consciously am and aspire to be effectively shuts out what I might be, could be, also am. Some of what I also am has been or is repressed because it was or is environmentally unacceptable. Some is simply unrealized potential. Through introspection, we can become aware of shadow aspects of the personality, but we may still resist them or fear their influence. And even where they're known and would be welcome, they're not readily available to the conscious will. For instance, I may be well aware that my intuition is shadowy, primitive, and unadapted, but not be able to call it up when it's needed. I may know that feeling is required in a particular situation but for the life of me can't muster it. I want to enjoy the party, but my carefree extroverted side has vanished. I may know that I'm due for some solitary introversion, but the lure of the bright lights is just too much. The shadow does not necessarily demand equal time with the ego, but for a balanced personality, it does require recognition. For the introvert, this may involve an occasional night on the town against one's better judgment, for the extrovert, it might involve, in spite of oneself, an evening staring at the wall. In general, the person whose shadow is dormant gives the impression of being stodgy and lifeless. Typologically, this works both ways. The extrovert seems to lack depth. The introvert appears socially inept. The introvert's psychological situation is laid bare in Franz Kafka's poignant observation Whoever leads a solitary life and yet now and then wants to attach himself somewhere, whoever, according to changes in the time of day, the weather, the state of his business and the like, suddenly wishes to see any arm at all to which he might cling, he will not be able to manage for long without a window looking onto the street. Similarly, the extrovert may only become conscious of the shadow when struck by the vacuity of social intercourse. There's a balance between introversion and extroversion, as there is between the normally opposing functions, but it rarely becomes necessary or even possible to seek it out until and unless the conscious ego personality falls on its face. And in that case, which happily manifests as a nervous breakdown rather than a more serious psychotic break, the shadow side demands to be recognized. The resulting turmoil may not feel so good. It may upset many things one has known or believed about oneself, but it has the advantage of overcoming the tyranny of the dominant attitude of consciousness.
If the symptoms are then attended to with some seriousness, the whole personality can be enlivened. There is by definition a natural conflict between ego and shadow, but when one has made a commitment to live out as much of one's potential as possible, then the integration of the shadow, including the inferior attitude and functions, from being merely theoretically desirable, becomes a practical necessity. Hence, the process of assimilating the shadow requires the capacity to live with some psychological tension. The introverted man, for instance, under the influence of his inferior extroverted shadow, is prone to imagine he's missing something, vivacious women, fast company, excitement. He himself may see these as chimeras, but his shadow yearns for them. His shadow will lead him into the darkest venues and then, as often as not, whimsically, abandon him. What's left? A lonely introvert who longs for home. And on the other hand, the extroverting introvert who's taken at face value, as a true extrovert, is liable to end up in hot water. Whereas the introverting extrovert has only himself to deal with, the extroverting introvert often makes a tremendous impact on those who cross his path, but he might not want to be with them the next day. When his introversion reasserts itself, he may literally want nothing to do with other people. Thus, the introverted intellectual whose shadow is a carefree Don Juan wreaks havoc on the hearts of unsuspecting women. True extroverts genuinely enjoy being part of the crowd. That's their natural home. They're restless alone, not because they're avoiding themselves, but because they have no parameters for establishing their identity outside of the group. The introverted shadow of extroverts encourages them to stay home and find out who they are. But just as introverts may be abandoned by their shadows in a noisy bar, so extroverts may be left high and dry and lonely when on their own. The opposite attitude and the inferior functions regularly appear as shadow figures in dreams and fantasies. According to Jung's understanding, all of the characters that appear in dreams are personifications of aspects of the dreamer. Dream activity becomes heightened when a function not usually available to consciousness is required. Thus, a man who's a thinking type, after a quarrel with his wife, for instance, may be assailed in his dreams by images of primitive feeling persons, dramatically illustrating a side of himself he needs to acknowledge. Similarly, the sensation type stuck in a rut may be confronted in dreams by an intuitive type showing some possible ways out. To assimilate a function, a subject broached above in the introduction, means to live with it in the foreground of consciousness. If one does a little cooking or sewing, writes von Franz, it doesn't mean that the sensation function has been assimilated. Assimilation means that the whole conscious adaptation of conscious life, for a while, lies in that one function. Switching over to an auxiliary function takes place when one feels that the present way of living has become lifeless, when one gets more or less constantly bored with oneself and one's activities. The best way to know how to switch is simply to say, all right, all this is now completely boring. It doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Where in my past life is an activity that I feel I could still enjoy? An activity out of which I could still get a kick? If a person then generally picks up that activity, he'll see that he's switched over to another function. And to some extent, assimilated an aspect of the shadow. The final word here must be that aside from the clinical implications of Jung's model of typology, its major importance continues to be the perspective it offers the individual on his or her own personality. Using Jung's model in a personally meaningful way requires the same kind of dedicated reflection as does getting a handle on one's shadow and any of the other complexes. In other words, it involves paying close attention over an extended period of time to where one's energy tends to go, the motivations that lie behind one's behavior, and the problems that arise in relationships with others. Modern technology has provided us with many useful tools, quick and easy ways to accomplish what would otherwise be onerous or time-consuming tasks. The process of understanding oneself, however, is not amenable to shortcuts.
it remains intractably linked to and enriched by individual effort. The book also contains two appendices. The first one is on the clinical significance of extroversion and introversion. It was written by H.K. Fears, who was a training analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich and had been the medical director of the Zurich Clinic and Research Center for Jungian Psychology for over 20 years. The second appendix is titled A Dinner Party with the Types, a scenario illustrating in a light vein how Jung's model of typology might look in everyday life. In it, the party is hosted by an extroverted feeling type and her introverted sensation type husband. Guests include a lawyer in the form of an extroverted thinking type, a married couple, an extroverted sensation type, and an introverted feeling type, illustrating how individuals with opposite dominant functions often attract and complement each other. Then there's the introverted thinking type professor of medicine, the extroverted intuitive type engineer, and the missing guest, the introverted intuitive type who neither showed up nor offered an explanation. He simply forgot all about it. This is absolutely a must read. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com where you'll find links to all the books that were mentioned today. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of the podcast, as well as a few blog posts that I've written. There's also a page on the life of C.G. Jung and another page with a listing of his books. So with eternal gratitude to Daryl Sharp, Charlie Arthur, Gary Sparks, and Diane Braden, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>